All right, welcome. Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. I'm your host, Dan Hanford, one of the managing partners at PassiveInvesting.com. And with us today is a special guest, Satish, I don't want to mess your name up again, uh, Singram, Singram. So uh, Satish, th thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you jumping on. Uh, we're going to be diving into this Cedar Run Apartments out of Memphis, Tennessee that you acquired, 416 units. We just closed on this thing last month, so it's fresh on your mind. Looking forward to diving into it. But before we do that, why don't you share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background and, and, and how you got into the multifamily space? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, I'm, I'm uh, grateful for that. And uh, about myself, um, uh, as everyone, I uh, migrated from India and um, back in uh, 2000s and um, uh, IT engineer, uh, worked in uh, major uh, IT companies uh, across US consulting uh, as well as you know, full-time jobs I have done. And, uh, but uh, basically the passion was uh, real estate. I found that in back in uh, 2013, I was uh, seriously thinking about uh, single family and you know, I uh, bought a couple of them and uh, uh, got very good uh, appreciation, 200% uh, plus appreciation. And uh, which in tune, you know, um, um, my thirst was you know, uh, to expedite the uh, financial freedom. I found a way that, you know, it's uh, only multifamily can uh, provide uh, that kind of expedite uh, financial freedom. So I, I wanted to learn all those nuts and bolts behind the scene, right? So uh, I joined James Kandasamy's uh, program and you know, I, other programs as well. I don't want to mention that, but I've been uh, all around, right? I have uh, spent a lot of money on that, uh, learning things first, and then I, I started investing passively. Uh, and uh, I've, uh, I've been, uh, you know, investing uh, since uh, 2013, uh, about uh, thousand doors, right? So I, I, when I received the passive check, right, uh, that's when I got, got hooked up, right? Um, so I, I just wanted to go deep dive and uh, I did the same. And you know, uh, after that, uh, one person uh, I have to mention here, uh, his name is Ajay Sharma. Um, he was the one who, you know, found uh, my thirst for you know getting into the multifamily and you know he gave me the opportunity uh, in his deal as a co-gp and um, that was the turning point for me and uh, from there on you know i i uh, i'm very much grateful for him for the opportunity and uh, definitely uh, um, uh, that was a turning point and after that i took over you know i do uh, deals and uh, this is uh, this, the, the recent closing was about uh, 416 unit that awesome. That's exciting. And so it's great to kind of see that he see and hear those stories of people that have, you know, kind of gotten started and started to acquire properties and how they got in. Uh, one of the things I, I do want to ask you about that process is a lot of people think about the, the cost of these programs that these different kind of multifamily mentors have. And you know, I don't have one of those. We can talk about this freely because I don't really care. Uh, but what, what what's what's your thought process on spending the money that you have to be able to learn the ropes and kind of get to where you are today. How much money would you say in total have you spent on your education and to actually get to this point? And at the end of the day, was it actually worth it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I, I strongly believe in, you know, mentorship programs, you know, I, I wanted to go from uh, point A to point B for where, you know, I either I have to uh, get connected with the experienced uh, operators or uh, have to uh, go with the you know uh, traditional uh, mentorship programs right so uh, i feel that is a worth uh, money that i spent uh, definitely that decision is wise like i i spent around uh, 30 to 40 grand uh, on that you know um, learning things and uh, you know putting things together uh, first of all and uh, understand because we are going to manage other people's money right so i need to do justice for my role, right? I need to understand ins and in and outs about uh, the entire process, right? I have to be well versed. So uh, I thought it is worth to spend that kind of money in order to, you know, um, uh, get into the field. Uh, but it's, uh, it, the results were amazing, and uh, I, I strongly believe in myself. Um, definitely, if I spend that money, definitely I will get the results. So that's why that's what's uh, intention behind uh, spending that kind of money to, you know, get into the programs. And I think something that's different that I see in, in just hearing your story from what I've seen from other people that have spent that money and it hasn't worked for them is taking the action necessary to get the result, right? I mean, so many people think, oh, I can just spend the money and then all of a sudden the success is going to follow. And it's just, it's definitely not the case. You, you definitely need to kind of 
pony up and, and, and pay the money and pay the fee, but to be able to get around people that have already done it and have that knowledge and experience and that can reduce your learning curve. But then you still have to take that action to be able to make it happen and put it into place. That's correct. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I, I, I am kind of person, to, you know, if I set a goal, definitely I will take action and I'll achieve that. Um, so uh, that's why I spent uh, money on myself to develop myself. So I got the result what I want. So. That's awesome. Well, let's dive into this pro this property here called Cedar Run Apartments over in Memphis, Tennessee, 416 units. So this is a big boy property here. So looking forward to diving into this. Tell us first, how did you actually come across this property and, and how did you actually uh, first kind of learn about it? Yeah, sure. It's a marketer deal. Uh, you know, we, we, we were, you know, I, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, my partner, Sridhar, lives in Dallas and Texas, right? So we we don't uh, to go uh, in a competitive uh, market, right? Um, so I I'm spending a lot of time on writing deals in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you know he, he used to do that in Dallas, Texas. But uh, you know uh, whatever for what some reason you know where, wherever we go and uh, we were in the Western Finals in Charlotte deals, you are a big player here. <laughs> We don't want to compete with you guys, right? You know, and uh, you know most of the deals we were in best in finals based on our resume, right? We have a lot of experience in uh, 400 plus properties, and you know, um, we got shortlisted, but and uh, but we didn't get the deal in hand, right? That was a disappointment we had for the past one year, and uh, you know, one day we one fine day we thought like, why don't we extend our horizon to you know not only in Atlanta or uh, Charlotte or uh, Texas markets? Why don't we go beyond uh, Memphis market, right? Memphis, um, uh, even though it has a you know bad reputation in the past, but the but the current rental uh, market is very good there, right? So while looking at the properties and deals, underwriting the deals, and uh, we found this property is a marketed property. It's by Capstone. Um, broker is also well versed, right? Um, so we didn't have a pre previous relationship with them, but you know, uh, we went to see other property uh, by Newmark. A um, couple other properties also we have saw. I mean, uh, we have seen. I, I personally went there to see the properties. So by then, this property also in the market. So I just uh, wanted to you know see that. The moment I saw the property, um, I was uh, very much interested to make an offer because, you know, after uh, coming back from uh, Memphis, we underwrote the deal and, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were uh, very much impressed with the numbers. So we have a conviction that we can do this, right? So, but it's a kind of a $40 million uh, property. Uh, it's very huge asset, definitely. Uh, but we have a very burning desire that, you know, this property is the one that we are looking for because the current uh, seller, uh, the previous seller, uh, they spent around 17 million on this property uh, from, you know, um, transforming that from, uh, you know, the structure alone he kept and he completely renovated all the units. And, you know, um, it's about um, a brand new, like a classy property, right? So that's that's one of the reason, and also many other reasons are there why we went for this, you know, uh, went behind this property. Uh, the other uh, important reason is pilot program. So Memphis uh, city has a pilot program. Uh, it's kind of a Lura here in uh, North Carolina, but it's not like a Lura almost uh, certainly I would say. Um, uh, it has some subsidy for the business operators. Um, uh, it, 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 it allows the operators to enjoy the tax benefit until for uh, next 20 years. So until next uh, 2038, uh, the taxes are stagnant, real estate taxes are stagnant. For uh, this kind of, the, I mean, 416 unit, right? Uh, we, if, if, the, if it is a market property, we have to pay around a million and a half in taxes. But whereas because of the pilot program, we are paying only 109K uh, per year. So that's wow. a huge savings uh, for the investors, right? So that's why the numbers were amazing, and you know we 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 thought like we can do it. So now now with that kind of uh, a tax advantages there, are you limited in the amount of rent increases you can have on the property because of that, or or how did you qualify for that program? Um, it's it's it depends upon the property, and you know, they have a very stringent um, uh, you know 
uh, procedures to follow on the property, like you know, securities, camera should be installed. The, the previous seller already implemented all, almost all the programs. We are just wanted to continuing that uh, the same program. And you know, um, we there is no rent restriction uh, per se, like you know, it's about uh, um, 60 to 70 percent. We need to maintain that ratio. That's all. Uh, it's not a very huge restriction on the rent. Okay. Okay. And was that already implemented onto the deal before onto the property before you actually acquired it? Or did you guys put it on afterwards? No, it is already there. So okay. they, they enjoyed about four years of the tenure and uh, they got another extension before the, 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 uh, the close of the property. So, okay. which means that uh, they got another 10 years. So, so we are, we are enjoying about uh, uh, 14 years of the uh, pilot program remaining. Even though if we are uh, if we are selling the property next in down the line in next three years, right? That next buyer will also enjoy the same benefit as my my previous seller. So hmm. that's definitely a value play there. So what was the actual purchase price that you mentioned? It was right right at forty million, or was it kind of? It's about thirty nine uh, uh, eight fifty something. Like that. Yep. Okay, so thirty nine eight fifty. So roughly about what ninety five thousand a door somewhere around in there. Yep. 95,000 a door. Okay. So 95K a door. And uh, how many offers were actually on this particular deal that were kind of alongside you that you were competing with? And then what did you do to kind of stand out from that crowd? So uh, uh, here uh, we have, uh, uh, we have been told that uh, they got multiple offers and uh, one offer was like around uh, 42 million, right? But the asking price was about 40. Uh, we went uh, with the 38850 so first round so we have been invited for best and final and uh, we have been told that uh, the deal is not uh, with us because um, there is another offer for 42 million uh, uh, weeks went by and uh, after that uh, there was a call from brokers saying that you know that uh, that didn't went through the they didn't you know the 42 million guy uh, you know backed out and uh, we are the second highest one, and you know uh, they wanted to consider uh, us if we are increasing the offer a little bit more. So we said no, we cannot do that. The numbers are not working beyond that point. So we negotiated uh, very well, and uh, just uh, 150k uh, more uh, we went with 39 um, million. Um, so we we, we are accepting uh, that offer, and then uh, they verbally said, you know, uh, the deal is yours. And then uh, we kickstart all the process, like you know, doing due diligence, um, uh, inviting uh, my uh, due diligence company uh, from Atlanta to do the due diligence day, and uh, all those schedules happened. And uh, we were uh, under contract before, even before the under contract, I completed my due diligence, like early access, seven days early access, right? So we we seller agreed for that, and uh, we did that. Uh, on the final day of the due diligence, we we were under contract. So. Good, good. And walk us through a little bit on the terms of that offer. Obviously, you, you came in and got it for the 39850. What were the terms as far as the timing on that, as well as the earnest money deposit? Yeah, the, uh, they were very particular about the timing, because uh, this is an enormous process of, uh, you know, transferring the uh, pilot program from the current seller to our name, right? There is a lot of work behind the scene uh, we have to do, even when the uh, day one of the contract. So uh, first thing first, um, the, the terms was like, I have to um, go with the uh, hard hard money about uh, 100K hard money and then uh, you know, uh, before the due diligence and then uh, 100 more uh, hard money on uh, uh, the final day of the due diligence. So that was one and uh, 200K hard money and, uh, and um, um, 15, sorry, uh, 15 days uh, due diligence and then um, 60 days um, to close with the two extension of, uh, you know, 15 days uh, extension, two extensions uh, with 15K every time we have to pay. So that's the terms. And uh, uh, seller was very uh, flexible. Uh, they are very big group um, and they have properties. They, they, they focus on uh, distrust assert and uh, bringing them to the market uh, like this um, and uh, they have specialized in that niche in that area 
Good, good. And uh, so it sounds to me like you gave yourself a little bit of a tighter timeline on the due diligence because of the early access agreement. So you pretty much had all that done. They like the seller liked that because it was an additional hundred thousand that went hard after that fifteen day period. Then you gave yourself kind of sixty days to close. Were you were you able to close it during that sixty day period of time, or did you have to opt for some of those extensions? No, we we uh, we. We were in a situation that it's not the, not the race, like it, it's about 12.2 million race. And uh, it is not the race uh, because of the procedural aspect from, you know, um, from Fannie Mae and uh, between the city of Memphis, right? So that, that was the delay we had. And due to that, a lot of hiccups, like, you know, we, we extended two times. We enjoyed the all the extensions. And then uh, when seller, uh, seller agreed for... Uh, couple more, I mean, one more also, like, you know, within a couple of days also, he agreed. And uh, we paid a lot uh, for that <laughs> extension, uh, 150K more. But uh, because of the city of Memphis has their, uh, you know, um, the 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 person who is handling this kind of transfer and all those things, they are not a uh, um, hired uh, employee of city of Memphis, right? They are uh, doing the non um, uh, NGO kind of voluntary kind of role. That is, that person was busy with a lot of lot many other things, and uh, that was causing a delay for us. And also, like Fannie Mae, initially they they said it is a conventional loan, but now, but after uh, going over the documents and all those things, um, they mentioned that this has to be moved to you know um, um, the um, affordable housing program. So that also a cost another delay so it's overall like you know it's a it's a procedural delay between the lawyer attorneys and you know between the groups city of memphis capital one and fannie Mae. all those all those people you know were talking and behind the scene it was you know um, causing the delay so so walk us through the business plan here what's kind of the business plan on what you're trying to do to be able to uh, improve this community and uh, and walk us through kind of maybe some interior and exterior renovation plans and and what you're planning to do from a from a, from a rental standpoint uh, as well yeah sure um uh, predominantly the 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 main reason why we went for memphis is uh, rental growth right uh, it's about 15% uh, rental growth and as per the real page data uh, last month right so main thing is that one. And uh, uh, so uh, the previous one had already addressed about uh, 237 units uh, to the premium level. Um, uh, the other units are in a, in a kind of a semi uh, upgraded units. So our business plan was, you know, um, we wanted to go and upgrade uh, the semi units to, to the premium level and increase the rent, like around 137 units. <laughs> so we have, uh, uh, left with 137 units, right? So we wanted to do out of 137, we want to do at least uh, 60 to 80 units um, down the line three years, right? So we wanted to keep the remaining 50 some units for the next buyer to, you know, it's kind of meat on the bone for the next buyer to do the remaining things, right? So we the business plan is like a unit upgrades. We have around 400K budget and, you know, playground upgrades. We have a budget. We, we are going to add dog park installation and a curb appeal and uh, exterior upkeep. And uh, we, 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 we thought like, you know, we can put carport as well. Like, you know, uh, carport is not a uh, big uh, selling point in, uh, in uh, Memphis, but uh, we are thinking to do carport. We are just uh, surveying about uh, the same. And the energy efficient lighting and all those things, you know, right? Uh, energy efficient uh, package, those things we are going to do. And we are going to add Fitness, fitness center also. So those are all the business plan we have in the, in place. But the properties already have a lot of amenities like you know uh, Amazon hub lockers, and they have uh, charging station, electronic, I mean electric vehicle charging station. So they have done very well uh, you know, in upkeeping the property. So let's let's walk through the uh, kind of upgrades because I think you mentioned the 137 units. They're going from a kind of a semi upgrade to the kind of premium level. What what exactly are you doing in that kind of semi to premium upfit for those you know 60 or 80 units that you're planning to do over the next three years? Yeah, it's a kind of uh, you know putting up uh, you know new flooring, upgraded uh, light fixtures, and you know, kitchen appliances, uh, uh, microwave ovens, right? Uh, new appliances will be uh, will be installed in those 80, uh, 80 units. Um, we have a package about uh, I mean six thousand uh, dollars calculated for per per door. 
um, we have uh, set aside for that. And what is the current effective rent on the property? And what are your what's your plan to increase it to over the next three years? So we have about uh, $900, $900 uh, average rental uh, in that uh, particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a plan to, you know, upgrade. Uh, uh, we, we are trying. Uh, property management is a well-known property management in that area. Like Multi-South is a property management company we hired. And they are very good at uh, managing this pilot kind of pilot asserts. Um, they have, mm -hmm. uh, they have a, about uh, 15 properties managing in that pilot program. So we are we are targeting about ten to you know twelve percent of rental hike um, between uh, the this uh, semi and you know upgraded units. So basically, trying to get the from nine hundred a unit to basically close to a thousand a unit somewhere around there. Yep. yep. Okay, and of course, and also kind of underwriting for the kind of organic rent growth just from the the rent growth in the market. What was that kind of uh, underwritten organic rent growth that you mentioned? Because I know you mentioned here being uh, last month, Memphis being 15%, but I can't imagine you uh, you underwrote for a 15% annual uh, rent growth. So what kind of was that number that you usually uh, or no, that you it's, did on this it's one? About, uh, it's about uh, only 4% rental growth in the year one. Uh, year one, it is zero uh, in our underwriting. And uh, organically, like in you know, year two, uh, we, we underwrote that deal for 4% uh, rental growth. Okay. And the rental bump uh, premium is about one forty to one fifty five dollars. That's what the premium rental per door. Okay. As per uh, you know, as per rent roll, they already achieved that you know for the premium units. So that was the selling point for us. You know, um, we were impressed with the rent roll uh, evidence that they are already achieving that uh, one hundred and forty dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And <laughs> how long did you? I, 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 to be able to renovate those 60 to 80 units, how much time did you give yourself in that kind of stabilization period? I know you mentioned doing it over the next three years. Is that really the plan? Like basically just over the next three years, being able to complete those 80, 60 to 80, or is there like a time frame in the beginning that you're gonna to try to get them done like on the first like 12 to 18 months or something like that? Yeah, 12 to 18 months, this was my sweet spot. Uh, we wanted to uh, do it ASAP. Um, we, are, we already started on the work. And um, uh, my property management is uh, fully with the, with us in, the, with, in terms of budget proposals and all those things, bidding and all those things. And uh, every every month, averagely, like you know, we are we are planning to upgrade uh, three units. Um, so, kind of uh, eighteen months, I would say. Uh, that's where uh, we're looking into. Okay. And walk me through the due diligence. Obviously you've went in there and I'm, I'm assuming you probably walked all the units and had your team do that as well as, you know, looking through all the leases and doing your lease audit and things like that. Was there anything that you, you found that uh, was in that due diligence process that maybe KB, maybe caused you a little bit of, you know, trouble or having to go back to the seller or anything like that? Or was it a pretty clean deal? No, uh, I would say it is a very pretty clean deal as per my assumption on the first look, right? When I went there and, uh, to see the property, right? The same assumptions are valid. Uh, even after the doing the due diligence, we went through uh, all the units. We walked through all the units. We have two teams <coughs> from Atlanta. Mm, he was uh, uh, my um, favorite vendor and uh, he used to fly, I mean, fly uh, from Atlanta to the property. And then you know, he walked all the units, um, uh, gave us a very clean report, and he was pricing about the property. The, the property was maintained very well. We couldn't actually do, you know, uh, see any anything uh, alarmingly. Um, so for the sake of writing, he, he wrote all those minor things like you know um, uh, addressing all those things. So other than, other than that, we didn't get any uh, major uh, you know um, red flags. Um, um, Aluminum wiring was there, but uh, it is only for 50 to um, 80 units. It was not remediated with the pig tiles. So uh, that was uh, the only item um, came in uh, with the due diligence, we, which we already know from the broker. Uh, they already told us, you know, aluminum wiring is there. We have, we have to remediate that. So we are kind of uh, pretty clean uh, with the report and uh, we were very happy with the results. And um, uh, we, uh, you know, we went ahead uh, with the, you know, uh, after due diligence period, uh, we wanted to go ahead and close this. So. Now with the aluminum wiring, did the uh, lender require you to do anything as far as like maybe pigtailing them or anything like that? Or was that already done? No, it is, it has to be remediated and we are working with the, uh, with the companies and uh, getting the bits uh, to address that uh, as a first 
sort of uh, priority for us. And um, um, that is um, uh, 90 days we have been given uh, to address those uh, pigtailing remediation from the insurance perspective. So is this a 60s or a 70s vintage? 72. 72. So very oh, close sorry, there. Sorry, 75. Sorry. 75. 75, 75. I figured it had to be somewhere in that range there if it had the aluminum wiring in there. Cause once you got into the 80s, you pretty much you don't you don't see that too much anymore. Yeah. Um, but definitely in the 60s and 70s, you definitely saw a lot of that aluminum wiring on, on in these types of buildings. Yep. Yep. Good. So let's talk about the financing on this asset. What did you do from a finance perspective? I know you already mentioned kind of working with an agency there, but uh, walk us through kind of uh, what you did as far as the financing on this asset? So yeah, financing side, uh, we worked with the Meridian Capital, uh, was my favorite lender. Um, so he actually, uh, um, from the right from the underwriting uh, days itself, uh, he was involved with us. And uh, he was a very kind of, you know, person like, uh, go do, make it happen, that kind of attitude person. So we love that guy, his name is Mark um, from Meridian Capital. And um, he helped us, you know, uh, to get the code from uh, Fanny, and it was uh, Fanny Floater uh, uh, loan, and uh, we have to buy the cap rate insurance, right? Um, cap uh, insurance also we bought, and uh, uh, we got a we got it underwritten uh, this deal for three point two five, but uh, he beat all the codes in the market, and then he brought it uh, final uh, term sheet uh, with the two point eight two percentage interest rate 2.82 that's great yeah how much is it floating above is it above SOFR or above LIBOR uh, above SOFR like you know uh, it's about one point right 3.85 is the maximum cap um, that we got okay so one point above uh, yep. SOFR yep okay Great. And, uh, and how many periods of, of IO, how, how much IO period did you get? And was it a kind of a 10 year term and 25 or 30 year AM kind of walk us through that? Yeah, it's about, uh, it's about four year IO and uh, 10 year, uh, so 30 year term um, we got. And uh, um, yeah, we have, we are pretty comfortable in that, you know, the, the business plan um, definitely will uh, uh, complete all the work um, before four years, right? Um, so we thought of uh, no, four years will be comfortable term for us. And I'm pretty sure with the floaters with Fannie, there's a as a, as a as a more palatable kind of prepayment penalty, right? It's not as as steep as the the yield maintenance. Uh, so what, what what's the actual prepayment penalty on this one? Uh, prepayment penalty is about one percent, I guess. I, say, I think it was like one percent. That's what that's I've seen those before on on the Fannie. We've definitely uh, considered them, um, so that's good. What was the loan to value you got on this one? Uh, we got about uh, seventy-two uh, percent, about twenty-nine million. We got uh, seventy-two point something. Yeah. Okay, and you said you ended up raising right at what, like twelve? Uh, I think you said like twelve point something million. Twelve point two million. Yes. Twelve point two million. Okay. Yeah, twelve point two million, and so let's let's like go through that right now as well. Just jump right into the, the how you structured this deal with investors and uh, how you went about raising the money. Yeah, sure. Um, the the uh, structure per se it is about straight uh, eight, 80, 20 percent. I mean, uh, uh, split, and uh, we didn't have any uh, much. Uh, you know, we don't want to uh, complicate things. But uh, since this is a huge rise, right? Um, so we wanted to give uh, investors who invest uh, beyond 250K, right? Um, we wanted to give them the GP cut as well, right? So uh, we have structure like, you know, um, those who invest uh, to proof TK or more, they will get, uh, you know, uh, apart from uh, whatever the LP equity, they will get 0.6% uh, up to 1 million, right? So if it is one million and beyond, uh, the the stab, I mean uh, the slab goes uh, up. Um, the overall uh, percentage of you know um, uh, they will get about nine percent cash on cash if they calculate, versus uh, if they are coming with the LP equity in eighty percent, right? Um, they'll get about eight to nine percent. So it's about uh, a percent more, as well as you know they'll get the GP uh, GP equity and. Uh, they are kind of you know a little bit more uh, compared to uh, those who are investing 50k or 100k. Okay, and then and if somebody invested less than 250k, what's kind of the waterfall structure on that one? Just like it's just a straight 80 20, and that's it. Just a straight 80 20 on that. We don't have any slab on that. We don't have any ceiling on that. We are just passing through all this. No preferred returns or anything like no, that. No, no preferred. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. And uh, so how did, how did you go raise, or how did you go about raising this money? Yeah, it, it was a very uh, Herculean task uh, because uh, my partner, Sridhar, he has done back-to-back uh, -back deals before. <laughs> yep. So uh, that, that was a, one of the challenges we faced. And you know, again, uh, Memphis market, right? Uh, Memphis market, uh, Memphis deal, uh, people uh, hesitated to you know um, invest in us um, initially. Initial response was like kind of slow. Um, we were you know, um, afraid um, that we cannot do, but uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, we, we went with the five or six C opportunity, right? So that gave us a freedom to discuss or uh, go public and you know, ask for money or uh, go over even if we don't know, right? We approach each and everybody and you know we, we asked for uh, uh, coming into the deal and uh, we tried some uh, private equity firms also, um, number of private equity firms, um, but uh, nothing was fruitful, uh, only uh, um, in the mid of uh, the fundraising, um, you know, we, we thought, okay, let's stop here. We don't want to go for private equity because they are asking all the entire chunk. They are asking our entire equity, like 12.2 itself. Whereas I, I have about 50% uh, of the commitment already by the retail investors. I don't want to give the money back for the retail investors, which will, uh, you know, my, my reputation will be in, in stake, right? So I don't want to do that. So, okay, what, what, what we can do differently, right? So when we thought about that and then and took an action plan, you know, uh, go um, add some more co-GPs, right? Co-GPs and, you know, they can, they can give an, uh, uh, be given an opportunity uh, in, the, in this deal. And uh, they came in and uh, a couple of them are uh, very well uh, um, uh, made, utilize this property, I mean, properly and uh, raise money for us. And also like, you know, we we went uh, with a large, you know, uh, pool of investors, retail investors asking for, you know, more cuts, you know, we, we increase the percentage from, you know, um, those who um, putting 500K and above, they'll get a um, uh, 0.8 something like from the GP cut as well. So that's how we completed the entire fundraise. So. That's great. That's great. So you may be able to you know, bring on some additional partners that can help you bring in some additional capital and, and participate mm -hmm. with the deal on the GP side and, uh, and got the deal closed. That's great. I'm glad to be able to see you guys were able to do that. So can you think of any other issues that happened on this acquisition that we haven't touched on yet that might be good for us to talk about? Uh, I don't think any alarming uh, thing other than the challenge between you know, the city of Memphis and you know, procedural aspects like uh, transferring pilot. Pilot has a separate board. They have to you know interview us as a new owners before you know even we are getting to contract. You know the the moment we made an LOI, the first thing the seller uh, said like after accepting our offer, go apply for you know uh, pilot transfer. That's the first thing they, they ask us to do. And we made the application. And you know, after that, they had a board interview, uh, which I didn't tell in the previous uh, part. So that's why I'm telling right now. And uh, that was the procedural things that made us, you know, a lot of challenging uh, things uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the government offices and all this stuff. So uh, I do have one uh, kind of question that just came to my mind that I actually had earlier that I wanted to make sure I had made a note to ask you about this is obviously given your time timeline here, we have uh, you know 15 days due diligence, 60 days to close, then you had two options to extend for another you know kind of 30 days. So technically here you had one, two, three, three and a half months to actually get this thing closed. And you also had the early access agreement, which actually started before you did your due diligence period. So you probably had four months that you actually were, were, were kind of yes. had this thing pretty much awarded to you where you uh, got it closed. At what point did you decide to start raising money and accepting money into your escrow account or your bank accounts to be able to close this deal? And the reason why I asked that is because I've seen some deals like this before where investors get frustrated because they wire money in early and they're like, wait a minute, why did this keep on getting extended? Is this thing going to actually close? And they get frustrated that their money is sitting there not making a return because they don't actually start earning anything, as you know, and everybody else does until you actually close on the property. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great question. And uh, we had the same challenge. But uh, I mean, fortunately, I would say fortunately, um, all my investors communications are very clear that, you know, every week, every week, hey, this is what 
the the point at which they those who ever uh, i mean wired the money very first like you know it's about may or june time frame and uh, um, we are keep on communicating them constantly like you know every week update say hey, this is the reason why this is happening this is happening so none of our investors are come came back and ask our money back ask their money back no no uh, no investors i would say so uh, that way we are you know we are pretty much uh, grateful for the <laughs> you know trust in us that that they kept right uh, so we we definitely owe them, owe them a lot and uh, we communicated keep on communicated uh, uh, until closing and they were okay with that you know they understood the procedural things was the only one um, that is causing the delay so somehow uh, we we did that consistently uh, uh, since uh, we were under contract we keep communicating that uh, via emails and uh, phone calls and uh, which uh, made us you know made them comfortable uh, in, uh, for the smooth closing well, Satish, thank you so much for being here and participating with this particular podcast. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. How can the listeners reach out to you if they have further questions for you about this particular episode and this particular acquisition, or maybe they just want to follow you more? Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'm in the social media, um, uh, all the social media like Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, and uh, they can reach me in uh, my cell number 920 944 4815. And also, they can uh, reach me in my email as uh, sathesh at fortuneinvestmentsgrp.com. So, both awesome. ways uh, they can reach me. In. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, I want to thank you again, once again, for, for coming on to the podcast. I know it takes a little bit of time to come on here and share this information, but hopefully it'll be a, a fruitful for you as well as our, our, our listeners and our base here. Uh, th- looking forward to continuing to follow you as you close more deals and also to have you on a future episode as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Dan. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the podcast. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye.